care about meeting the needs of students. <laughs> so uh, anyway, Friday, Friday I uh, went to the gas station to put gas in, and I put my card in, and it said, see cashier. So I go into the cashier, and she says, she runs it, and she goes, I'm sorry, honey, but your card doesn't work. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And so I took the card back, and I thought, well, must be this station. And so I went across the street, ran my card again, and it didn't work. And um, so I went to work thinking, well, you know, I'm out of gas, I don't have any cash, but it's probably just my worn out old debit card. I'll take care of it later. Get a call about noon. My wife is at Meyer and her card has also been rejected. And um, so they took our groceries and they went and put it in the cooler. <laughs> so we went on a date. We got done with a date. We're like, you know, I'm sure like most of you, after you get done with a date, you're kind of that awkward drive home. You're like, well, what should we do now? Right? And say, let's go to Meyer and get our groceries out of the freezer. So we rolled. That's the way we talk. We rolled to Meyer and um, went through the customer service line. Man, was that embarrassing. Here we are standing in the front of Meyer, the customer service line, and it, it looked kind of like we just got enough money to get our groceries, so we were there to pick them up. And we kept trying to explain to people, honest, we don't know why our debit card is not working. And so um, after much embarrassment, they found our groceries, and they found our five packs of Disney photos all froze in the cart. And then um, we went home, and the next day I got on the phone, and anybody have National City? They're the worst. Oh, man. So according to National City, there was a security breach, and they preemptively canceled our card, sent us a notice, which we never got, and sent us new cards, which we never got. And that, so we didn't know that they had, were going to deactivate our cards. So my wife was talking to them, and they transferred, transferred, and we got this credit card holder services, which we thought was part of National City. Turns out it's a separate company that handles accounts for credit unions. And has anyone ever experienced anything like this? Oh, my goodness. So apparently this happens quite frequently with credit unions. Credit unions don't have enough staff so they have this company that does this and reissues these cards and so they so national city says sorry it's our fault and then this cardholder services says oh perhaps your account number got out there and got compromised so no one can give us a straight answer and as of today we still have no debit cards and i don't know if i've mentioned it in here before but i live by my debit card i recently started using it at mcdonald's if that gives you any idea you know, like I just I never have cash. It's hard to get to get cash in it. Anyway, so we're gonna talk about lost, stolen credit cards, debit cards today. That's why I tell you that story. Although the card was neither lost or stolen, that's what they did to us. Yeah. No, that that doesn't really work too often. Yeah. It's a little more subtle approach. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway. Uh, we're going to talk about that, but we'll also talk about uh, other areas of consumer law like uh, deceptive advertising, labeling and packaging, sales, credit protection, consumer health and safety, as well as even uh, state consumer protection laws. And if you're busy writing all those down, you don't have to because we'll go into each one of them. There it is again, puffing. I think that's the term of the semester. If you don't... If you, if you don't go away knowing anything, go away knowing what puffing is. So vague generalities, obvious exaggerations that are made in advertising are not to be believed and are not considered by the Federal Trade Commission as deceptive. You've seen these ads on TV, haven't you? You see something and you just know it's so ridiculous that no one actually believes it happens. What kind of commercials do you see? 
So I have students complain about the the long silence in my podcast. So if you guys have anything you want to say or add, that would be great. What? Beer commercials. What about them? They have horses playing football sometimes. And that's not possible? or what? Yeah, so uh, <laughs> you never drive down the road and you look over and there's a horses in the field and they're all playing football. That doesn't really happen. Or there's like one now I see where like, a guy uses it to get a bear to chase it. What was it? You might know what I'm talking about? Right. Settle the bear down, and then his buddy steals it. Right. Yeah. So I'm not believing that either. And then there's all there's like this rash of commercials where like a truck is pulling a ship, or pulling some semi over top of itself, or some stupid thing like that. Used to be a commercial a long time ago. I don't think they make the geo tracker anymore. Oh, you're going to say something else? I was having a connection with you there. You get all excited. The Hoover vacuum cleaner where you pick up the bowling ball and stuff. Yes. And underneath it. Yes. Man, I would have paid to see that bowling ball crush that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great one. There used to be, I, I don't know if they make the Geo Tracker. I don't think they make that anymore. No, might be Chevy. called something else. Chevy, Chevy something or other. Yeah. So they used to have it where it would pull up and pull a semi, and the truck. <laughs> The truck driver would be all upset, like, oh, gosh, can't believe this geo tracker is pulling me. And then it would say across the bottom of the screen, hey, stupid, don't try to actually do this. This is just an exaggeration. Like the Toyota Meteor Proof truck. Yeah, the truck that gets hit by a Meteor. Yeah, yeah. So the FTC doesn't spend a lot of time pursuing that and saying, oh, gosh, you're being deceptive. What if you lead consumers to believe, you know, yeah. I mean, what if they try that out or something? Um, they do spend some time on bait and switch. Anyone ever heard of that? Yeah, it's on the slide. Where, where, where have you heard that before? <laughs> what? Uh -huh. what? Marketing class. Oh, yes. And what did you talk about in marketing class? Oh. Show or advertise when you get to the store. And it's actually, oh, sorry, we don't have that anymore, but you can buy it. Right, and then it's like an intentional scheme to get you in the door, but then to switch you to a more expensive product. Has that ever happened to anyone? Second City, you like the improv comedy place, or oh, Circuit City? Oh, I thought you said Second City. Oh, yeah, they look so good, don't they? There you go. Yeah, I. We went into Pizza Hut, and, you know, when they do the commercials on TV, are always Jessica Simpson or, you, you know, waitress. right, you know, and that didn't happen. And so I took my family into Pizza Hut. I sure hope my wife is not listening to this. Um, I took, took my family into Pizza Hut this weekend, and not only did Jessica just not come out with poppers or whatever she does, um, but the waitress saw some food laying on the, hello, we'll have to cut that out of the podcast. Uh, so there's a there's some food laying on the uh, salad bar. What do you think she did? Ate it. No, <laughs> she might as well have done that. <laughs> yeah, you, we watched her. She scoot, scoot, scoot. We're like, well, that's cool. They see a little mess out there. They're gonna clean it up. Boom, dumps it back into the with the rest of the stuff. And then my wife said, oh, that's disgusting. She goes up there and she goes. She asked for a spoon. Of course, she never got it. So she goes up to get a spoon. Would you give me a spoon, please? And and the, the gal reaches out and grabs the spoon by the the spoon part and hands it to her. And then the manager was in and out of the bathroom about ten times while we were there. So so anyway, it was not quite the commercial experience we we thought. Right? Yeah. And then we can't even pay for our food. Uh, so sometimes things are a little different uh, commercially than they are in real life. Um, for some reason, whenever I mention bait and switch, people are like, oh, ABC Warehouse. That's a common one that comes up. Or like cars that are advertised, zero down, uh, no payments for 50 years, that kind of stuff. But then when you get in there, there never seems to be that car for that kind of deal. But... Uh, that's why there's a lot of effort to put disclaimers on ads. Like, what kind of things do you see in ads to try to avoid the whole accusation that it's bait and switch? And uh, that's another thing. 
supplies. Right. While supplies last, we only have uh, limited quantities per store. Um, sometimes they give you rain checks because they don't want you accusing them of, of not having anything in stock. Um, or, you know, they'll just say, once we're out of this quantity, we won't be able to give you the deal. Yeah. So similar to like where Walmart will put like a display of something totally unrelated to something else next to something. Like, you know how they do like promotional things like in the grocery aisles for like just crazy stuff and you go over there and you're like, oh, maybe I should pick this junk up too because it's right here. But then you get the junk, you mean? Well, it's like the product placing of like um, totally unrelated things so that when you yeah. go for the thing that's on sale, you see, you see something else and you go, oh, maybe I should pick this up too. Mm. Might have the milk in the back of the store because you need milk. And you have to go to back to the store to get it. So then Is that get why that's milk. always bugged me? Other, that I have to go to the back of the store. The, the back of the store right. The Except for me, my milk and photos are kept in the same place in the <laughs> freezer in the back of the customer service. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's like two different ones. There's one at the back and one at the side. And Bob, who was on the other end of the walkie-talkie, had to go all over the store well, to find our right car. I know. I felt like I felt humbled. I'm like. You know, I'm sure there'll be time in my life when I have not even enough money to buy groceries. This must be what it feels like. You're just standing there going, please find our groceries. But um, no, not so much product placement, but like what if, uh, you know, I won't name any stores or van, but you go into them and they're advertising like a whole furniture set or whatever, and you get in there and they, they never had it, right? And they're like, oh, yeah, that, that feels horrible, doesn't it? You know, they'll have something that's really trash oh you want this mattress or you want whatever and if their intent is which i'm not saying that any particular company engages in this but um, if their intent is just to lure you in to switch you to a more expensive product then the ftc doesn't like that they call that bait and switch and so that's deceptive because they really don't intend to sell you what you think um, other things are not so deceptive because isn't it pretty common to advertise attractive low prices. I mean, think about it. I, I, my favorite was the day after Thanksgiving, Best Buy Circular, $1 laptop. You know, ooh, this is, I need a laptop, but for a buck. So one time my family, I go to my in-laws for Thanksgiving. The next day we get out and go crazy uh, shopping. And at uh, 3 a.m., get my thermos, get my lawn chair, go down to Best Buy. I'm going to get that dollar laptop, right? Pull in a parking lot, and it's full, right? And there's a line around the Nine back of Best Buy. Yeah, I'd, I'd see, I'd, like 3 a.m., I'm ha-ha-ha, evil plan. I'm going to be first in line and take those deals from everyone else. And so I'm like, oh, what the heck? What else do I got to do at 3 a.m.? So I take my lawn chair and my thermos, and I start walking, and the line goes all the way around the building to the other side, right? And then I get there, and I'm like, I find out that there's people walking through the line saying, hey, what, what is it you're here for? And issuing vouchers. So even if I ever, you know, I wait till 6 a.m. to get in the store by the time I ever get there, I'm not going to see this dollar laptop. But they've made an effort to let people know that before they open the store that that's what's going to happen. It's a good chance you're not going to get that deal because limited quantities at the store. Um, I haven't done that again. Sometimes that deceptive advertising can take place online. Has anyone ever purchased anything online and then after they put in their credit card or something, they get additional fees or something tacked onto it? That should not be happening. Occasionally it does with less reputable sites. Like what should happen is if there's shipping, handling. Hand I don't understand. What are handling fees? Yeah. I mean, they grow up the product and they charge you for it. I don't understand. What, what does that mean? I mean, how are they going to move the product without handling it? I don't quite understand that, but yeah, there's... Won't drop kick it won't right, drop yeah. Kick it they, they handle it with gear. <laughs> I don't know. So you pay extra so that they don't drop your product or something. Yeah. So anyway, they should let you know those shipping, handling, extra fees before you pay. Like uh, we went into Friday's Friday. That's kind of weird. And... Um, we, there was about eight of us, and we all had dinner. And then when we got our bill, they tacked on an 18% gratuity before we paid for it. And it was disclosed, but no one said anything. 
Oh, yeah, it probably was in the menu or something, right? Yeah, that's something. Yeah, so I was about ready to add on the tip on top of that when I, whoa, my cheap, cheap alert meter went off and said, whoa, I think I'm already paying for this. So, yeah, it is. I usually go for about 20, but not since I can't use my debit card. <laughs> and um, so same thing online. Up front, here's all the fees, and then you click the button. And the same thing with agreements. You know, a lot of times you're clicking buttons, you're not paying a whole lot of attention to all the things that you're agreeing to. But you should be able to go to a clear and conspicuous hyperlink that takes you to the long version of whatever it is that you're agreeing to. Because all kinds of terms that you agree to when you use eBay or PayPal, something like that. So the Federal Trade Commission, FTC's job is to not only create the rules, but also to enforce them um, and try to prevent deceptive advertising, which could include everything, including um, issuing cease and desist orders. Stop doing what you're doing. Don't advertise that product because it's deceptive. Don't use that type of advertising. For example, anybody remember Joe Camel? Yeah. What happened to Joe? Did Joe? He died, he died of cancer. Yeah. <laughs> no. What's that? He was too appealing to kids. Right. He was too appealing to kids because my kids every day are like, Daddy, can we see a camel? No. <laughs> they actually never do that. But what's that? Dressed up in a suit. Right. Yeah. But Apparently, ideas cartoons attract kids, and if they're smoking cartoons, then then that's bad. So Joe Camel went away because the FTC said that's deceptive. That'll get kids to start smoking. Uh, they may even impose counter advertising. They themselves, or they might order the offending company to say what we told you before was wrong. But think of an example. Yeah, some kind of retraction. Anybody think of an example of that? Anybody ever seen the Philip Morris commercial on TV where they say no good cigarette or no cigarettes a good cigarette commercial? Uh, you know. Yes, that's it, right? And so you remember that because I don't know it's some web page and they're clicking around and they're telling you why are they? Why did they have to do that? I mean, did they just out of the goodness of the heart? Hey, we should start a campaign and tell people that there's no good cigarettes. Right. Light cigarettes are the, the healthy alternative, right? But what did people do? We learned smoke more. Right? So no cigarettes are good cigarettes according to the counter advertising. Another area that there's federal law is uh, telemarketing. Anybody in here a telemarketer? You were? for. <laughs> it was the worst thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah? Did you take a lot of abuse? or? Yeah, I did it for two weeks, and um, my <laughs> boss asked me to just try it, and I'm not really opposed to trying anything. Uh, so I did it for two weeks. Okay. It was terrible. Yeah? Yep. Well, why? People are really rude to you. <laughs> yeah? And I just don't like being the person everybody hates. <laughs> I can understand. I think that's natural. Right. That's, I think it's natural. You never really realize how angry and vicious you can be till a telemarketer calls. Like, like here is my favorite one, um, ADT. Anybody know who ADT is? All right, you know those blue signs, right? So I get a call. Well, no, my wife gets a call one night. There's been break-ins in your area. You need ADT. <laughs> Right, so I was away somewhere, and she calls me. She's like, there's a guy I just called, said there's been break-ins in the area. I need ADT security systems. <laughs> I'm like, what? yeah, that's not a, I didn't think that was a real good strategy. Yes, yeah. I could tell you another story about that, but, <laughs> right? He's outside. There's been break-ins in your neighborhood. So, anyway, so I come home, and the next day there's a knock at the door. Right, and so I'm like, I'm the man. Let me handle this. Right, so I go to the door. I open the door, and there is a guy standing in the yard with the ADT signs stuck in the yard. And he says, "How would you like to have one of these signs in your yard?" 
and I explained him where I wanted him to put that sign. Yeah, like yeah. <laughs> right. I, well, I, I implied it. I didn't really say it, but I implied, no, that's not where I want that sign to be. And I said, please, you know, get off my property. Quit calling. Quit coming back here. Um, and so guess what happens the next day? Phone rings. Right? I said, look, I told you people not to call me. Uh, I told you people not to come here. And I had the statute. I printed off the statute. And so I said, you know, it feels to me like you are being willful, right? That, that I could sue you civilly and that I might be in, entitled to up to treble damages. So they actually go in and take the treble dial off of their stereo. <laughs> Thank you. No, treble damages means what? Anybody? <laughs> yeah. A life of base. Right? Treble damages means triple. So three times the amount of damages if it's a willful violation. So if you can establish a pattern where you said, please take my name and number off your list, but they keep calling you, harassing you, there's actually a private civil action you could bring. Uh, FTC can also come down on them, but if you can establish it as willful, you could get triple the amount of damages. Yes. Well, um, no, so magic words, but um, enough to comply with the statute. So, like it says there at the bottom, if you insist that they take your name off the list, then they're supposed to do that. Now, do they? You know, since this slide, there's also the do not call registry. And, that's a and, that's a and that, you know, yeah, that's another thing is in every statute that gets, finally gets through the legislature, there's a lobbying group that says we don't want to be, you know, included. So if, it, if you already have an ongoing business relationship, that's one. So someone always insists, well, we're already, you know, this is, account maintenance or something, or if you're not selling something, right? So you ever get that call where you're like, why are you calling me on the do not call? And they're like, oh, we're not selling anything. Yes, they are. Right. Yeah, a survey, that's, that's a pretty common one. Or donation, Char charities. Are so oh, you had to say that. So we got the inside uh, here. You had to say you were taking a survey so you would get around this. So. Your what? My little brother and my cousin both do that over, uh, over off East Paris. Do like surveys. Call out there where they do surveys. Awesome. I had somebody call me up earlier today. I actually asked him for um, a donation for the like his oh, no. sheriff deputy. Oh yeah, the fraternal order police or or yeah, something like. Was, was the, those people no, are. Yeah, I'm not going to give you any money. <laughs> And he was what like, crazy? and then he said, well, got mad at you. Yes. Right. Wouldn't that be money? <laughs> You're trying to trick me here. Never mind, I'll just pick it up in my van in front of the building. Anyway. Right. I'll mail it for you. Yeah. So, from what I, I mean, my experience with the Fraternal Order of Police is they are like the most aggressive. And if you say no, they get angry and they're like, what about the children? You know, we fingerprint, we do all this stuff. They just won't quit. There you go, those nasty telemarketers. That's sick. Yes. <laughs> Beep. So, um, have you ever got the automated or recorded solicitations? Right. They really want me to go to Disney World. I get those all the time. Do you? Um, there is a law that says they're not supposed to do that, but there's a lot of exceptions. Charities are exceptions. Political campaigns are exceptions. Again, if they already have an ongoing relationship with you, that's an exception. So you're really not supposed to get these. Like I got stalked by the Grand Rapids Press. Have you ever, has that ever happened to you? And the message is this, always the same. Sorry we missed you. Even if you pick up the phone and start talking, sorry we missed you. And it, it goes through, and then it gives you a number to call. So one time um, when we moved back up here, they started calling the house, this automated uh, recording, and I said, I called the number. I'm like, look, don't call me again. Our number's on the do not call registry, and I hung up on him. And my wife said, you realize we've moved and changed our phone number, right? Uh, no, I didn't. So, so if you do move and you get a new phone number, 
All right, then you've got to make sure that you put that number on the do not call. I think it's do not call .gov. I'm, I think that's right. I'm not sure. You can go out there and check it out. Uh, let's see. Anything else? No. Good enough. Labeling and packaging. Won't spend a whole lot of time on it. There's a variety of different acts. Some of them are quite old from things as diverse as wool and fur, which I'm sure you guys are heavily into wool and fur. Yeah. Um, me personally, uh, there's a law against flammable kids' pajamas. I think that's kind of cool. Um, you know, even you, even you, when you were a little kid, you had that clingy tight pajamas, right? I see you didn't burst into flames. Right? So there's an act about that. Uh, that the packaging and labeling that's put on products should fairly reflect what's actually inside. Smokeless tobacco, a lot of people, you know, focus on tobacco and all the warnings that go on that. There's actually laws relating to um, educating people about the hazards of smokeless tobacco. Anybody in here chew? Usually most of the women in, you know, my class chew. But no? Yeah? Yeah? She does, she's not having it? She likes your beard, but she doesn't like you. Really? Wow. Awesome. <laughs> so um, there's nothing quite like I used to have in when I was in the military. A lot of lot of uh, guys that chew. There's nothing like picking up a cold cup of spit that you think is your coffee or a coke and guzzling it down. Oh, the warm God. one is the worst. The warm. I don't know. I'd rather have it a little warm and mucusy than than cold and kind of nasty. But anyway. Moving on, uh, nutrition labeling education, you're probably most familiar with that, right? When you go in the store and you look at, you get your groceries out of the freezer and you look at it and then it, you know, it says something on it about, um, you know, what it actually contains, uh, discloses nutritional information. This is all consumer law. Sales. Sure. Because mm -hmm. right, you really don't have to know all those different acts. Right. Other than other than their names and what year they were passed. <laughs> so uh, sales. When I say sales, you know everybody's like, "Oh, yuck, sales." Right, Amway or whatever. But um, any of you in sales any, or had time where you've been in sales? Yes. What kind of sales? <laughs> what? <laughs> that was that was Rebecca, by the way. Just to, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sales. I've had sales. Yeah, BA, whatever. Did you? Awesome. So, so did you get trained? Well, they go into orientation and then they start off right away. Yeah, and what kind of things they tell you you have to do? Blindfolded, like or something. Yeah, yeah. 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 Awesome. Anyone else do sales? Not the class, but you did. You did vacuums. All your friends are in sales. Cutco. Oh, knives. Yes. So we'll look at each one of these. Door-to-door -door sales. Um, with door-to-door -door sales, there's a certain amount of pressure. Like, for example, Rainbow Vacuum Cleaners or Kirby Vacuum Cleaners. Perhaps you guys can enlighten me. What I believe the strategy is, is to get in the door and don't leave until you sell. We had it all set up to where people wanted it, but they didn't They wanted it. They, they get a free room saved out of the door. Ah, uh, okay. okay. So somehow get there, you know... Um, vacuum up anything, right? So like axe murder someone, then suck up the blood, suck up bowling balls, suck the paint off your car, whatever. And then you're like, wow, this is the coolest vacuum. It's worth $5,000 or whatever they were, were worth. But, you know, some people, once you get in the door, they feel obligated to buy something or like in order to get rid of you, they're going to buy something. 
And so most states have statutes that say if it's door-to-door -door sales, the consumer has a cooling off period. Most often it's three days. Okay. So um, what's it called when you enter into a valid contract but you may be able to back out of it? Voidable. Voidable, good. So if you're into door-to-door -to -door sales, which actually one of the practical exercise questions relates to this, then you should think about that, that even though you think you have a deal, the consumer might be able to back out. So you may want to wait a period of time to ensure that you have that contract. Um, my wife and I, when we lived down in Kalamazoo, we lived behind Western Michigan University. And every college student there had to sell magazines in order to apparently stay within the university. So they're always knocking on our door trying to sell those magazines to us. And I wasn't home during the day, so my wife would always get them and they'd say, can I have a half hour of your time to tell you about all these different magazines? And she'd say, as long as I can have a half hour of time to talk to you about something really important, <laughs> then they'd run off. So <laughs> That's one take. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I didn't really mean that, honey. Uh, so cooling off periods are important in door-to-door -door sales, um, other kind of sales, telephone and mail order. When you get something from the, uh, through the mail that you ordered, it should be shipped within the time that they advertised or promised. If it doesn't, they should notify you that it, they couldn't fill your order. Sometimes they call that back order. And if they can't get you the back order, then they should issue a timely refund. Now, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you don't get your stuff, or you don't get it in time, or sometimes you never see the back order. But there actually are laws that try to get consumers the products that they ordered in the time that they were promised. Uh, some things come through the mail, but you never asked for them. That bottom bullet there talks about unsolicited merchandise. Anybody ever got anything in the mail they didn't ask for? I checked the AOL thing. Those, those discs, yeah, they just keep coming and coming. Yeah, like an off-road DVD. Cause I just opened the magazine. Okay. DVDs. Yeah. Anything else? You did? Awesome. Did you ever see the money? No. Uh, it's not fair. Um, yeah. Um, what's really not about the money is about the learning, isn't it? Like even if you got all that money, you'd still be here. I get, I mean, I get all kinds of weird things. I get diapers. I get, uh, you know, Men, remember when you became a man age 18 got the Mach 3 razor in the mail? You get like the pens? Or I get the pens. <laughs> no, I, actually they haven't yet. That will be a depressing day when I come back from the mailbox and there's like a depends there. I, 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 I do know people around my age who got the, the uh, AARP membership type thing or uh, pantyhose, feminine products, uh, soap. I now. Right, yeah. Um, <laughs> Lots of things. So this stuff comes the unsolicited dead squirrel. I got one of those. Um, if you get a dead squirrel in your mail, you can keep it. So you know, the Postal Reorganization Act, which is kind of a weird place for it to be, but it says if you get something in the mail you didn't ask for, you can keep it. Now, be careful. I'm not saying when you get your neighbor's, neighbor's stuff by mistake, keep it. Or if you, you asked for something, you agreed to something, that you're not bound by it. Because a lot of times people say, well, what about BMG or some of these other places? Why, you know, why is it they're sending me stuff and then they want to charge me for it? Often in those kind of things, they're sending you something and you agree to something and then they start shipping you. But if you get stuff unsolicited and it, like my wife got uh, three children's books and it said, we're giving these to you. If you don't want them, ship them back. If you keep them, we'll assume you want to keep them and we'll charge you for them. That's against the law. Yeah. Yeah, it, well, I don't know if it's the same situation. Yeah. Right. I don't know if it's the same situation. I told her to keep the books. She's like, well, I don't want to ship it back and pay the, the shipping fees. No, just keep it. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, there's nothing illegal about that. No, but once you do that, then after you get your 12 CDs, 
they'll send you CDs, and then if you don't want them, check the box. Or right. Mail it back. Mm -hmm. That you know that's so common. I'm assuming there's something that you're agreeing or, to. Or no, that's what it is. I've done it before, where they charge you shipping and handling. You'll end up paying like forty dollars for the CDs or whatever. But you have to make sure that you cancel your deal. They'll keep sending them to you. You have to keep yeah. sending them money. Otherwise, they can come after you because they have your credit card information. Yeah. Yeah. Usually, those are some kind of agreement you initially entered into, but but I don't know. All right, health and safety. That's just another area, um, both in terms of. Uh, Food that's alleged to be pure or healthy for you. Um, drugs is a regulated area under consumer law. Um, consumer product safety, so in addition to warranties and product liability, there's also uh, federal statutes out there that talk about products having to be safe and a commission that oversees that. Credit protection is another area. Here's... Uh, four different laws that you should be aware of. Um, TILA, or the Truth in Lending Act, pretty much a disclosure law. There's another slide on this, so we'll talk about it in more detail. Fair Credit Reporting Act, Fair Debt Collection. It's not just the reporting, but collection of debts. And how wages, or if wages, can even be garnished. So... TILA. Say it's basically a disclosure law because it's designed to let you know what credit is costing you. And if you ever had a, like a major ticket item like a car, or house, or something, you ever seen that box on the front page of the contract that says, this is what you're borrowing, this is the annual percentage rate, this is what it's going to cost you to borrow this money. All that is supposed to be uniform under TILA because you can get accurate information. So before TILA, they'd say, oh, good news, your interest rate is 1%, and then in fine print it'd say per day or something. Okay, but now it's an annual percentage rate. And the other reason that, that they do that is so that you can compare what it costs you to get credit one place to what it costs another. Uh, under TILA, there's also some rules around credit cards. And you guys might have experienced it. I experienced a little of that this weekend. Um, what should you do if you lose or misplace or your credit card gets stolen? Yes, same thing with debit cards, too. And under this law, it limits your liability. Um, anyone ever, like, not so much had their credit card lost or stolen, but your credit card company thinks that it did, like if you travel? Has that ever happened to anybody? Um, right, sometimes they might call you and you're not there because you're somewhere else or um, they'll, they'll just qu quit allowing it to work. Um, I was with a group that uh, flew from here to Seattle and a guy used his credit card here. Then he flew to Seattle and we went to dinner, went up in the needle there in Seattle, had big fancy dinner, and then he laid down his card and they said, sorry, you, you know, we can't honor your card credit card company says to reject it. So they bring the phone to the table and he calls and they're like, we just didn't know how you could have used it here and then used it on the other side of the country. But it's called traveling. It, it is in a way, but then it's kind of like embarrassing. Yeah. Right. Uh, Equal Credit Opportunity Act. Now, it says up there that it uh, requires credit to be extended without regard to race, sex, color, national origin, age, or marital status. But how many of you in here are married? Okay. So uh, do you think I get different credit than you? I'm married, you're not. Uh, I'm male. Some of you in here are female. Do you think we get different credit? Yep. Um, different races? Uh, all those things, actually, they're not equal. So how is that possible? How come I get different credit than you? Not to say it's good, better or worse, but... 
Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, so um, age is uh, not supposed to be a discriminatory factor. You might feel bad that I get different credit than you because you're younger than me. That should be a good thing, right? Yes, excellent, yes. Yes, right, right. So as long as they don't say we're only extend credit to married people, as long as they don't say only of this race or sex, et cetera, then if you have the opportunity to get credit, you're okay. But as long as it's based on some other factors, primarily your credit score, which may be affected by any one of these things. Um, sometimes marital status isn't a good thing in terms of credit because whoever you got married to doesn't have good credit, right? Uh, same thing with age, you know. The, more, the older you get, the more mistakes you make versus you might be younger and not have a bad credit history. But there is... There's not equality in all those areas, but there should be equal opportunity. All right, don't worry so much about consumer leasing. What else you want to worry about? Fair credit reporting. The first bullet up there says it limits the activities of credit reporting agencies. It basically requires them to report what they've been told okay, and limits what they can uh, do with the information they have. Basically, they can report it for credit purposes, and that's it. And in exchange for being highly regulated, they got the benefit of not uh, being sued successfully. Uh, basically, unless you can prove that a credit reporting agency was grossly negligent, or is intentionally trying to mess you over, they're not going to be liable. They're just reporting what they've been told. So if you've ever, anybody ever got a credit report? Yes? Wouldn't give it to you? Really? Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's like legitimate websites and there's other ones out there that charge you for what you can get for free. So you have to be careful about that. But yeah, you're now entitled to those credit reports. And um, if anyone's ever seen them, I haven't seen too many that are entirely accurate. Like mine had me working places and I never worked and living places I never lived. But usually there's one or two errors on those things. I guess the less credit you have, the less chance there are errors, it seems like. But um, this is probably not a real big deal until you try to get credit for a home or car or something, and then you're denied it because of some error that's in this credit report, and then you get really kind of ticked off at them. And usually they say, well, get in contact with whoever reported this information, clear it up with them, and we'll report it correctly. Fair debt collection practices. So this is not so much in reporting credit, but in trying to collect debts and the law prohibits collection agencies uh, or limits when, how they can contact you, who they can contact. Uh, they're not supposed to harass or intimidate you or use false or misleading information. Um, of course, I always have students who say, that's not true. They called my parents or they lied to me. They tricked me to talk to me or um, they didn't call me within the hours they should have. You know, if they call you at work, can they call you at work? Yes, but if you tell them not to call you at work, they're not supposed to. Um, can they call you? Yes, even if you have an attorney. You tell them that you have an attorney that's supposed to contact your attorney, not you. Um, and really, they can't keep harassing and intimidating you. If you dispute the debt, then they need to do something else about it instead of keep calling you about it, which basically means forget it or sue you. When they uh, do try to collect the debt, they're supposed to provide a validation notice up there, which basically is, we believe you owe this debt. Do you dispute it? Now, why do I tell you? Well, one, I tell you this because you have rights as a debtor when someone is trying to collect a debt from you. But also because if you're not careful, you can become a debt collector. Occasionally, I get a student who's like, okay, I... I uh, listen to the podcast, now I'm a lawyer, and their buddy says, hey, someone owes me money, and they go, will you write me a letter to them that says, pay up or we'll sue you, right? 
As soon as you write a letter to someone that says, you owe us money, and if you don't pay, we'll sue you, guess what you are? A debt collector yeah, who is harassing someone. And if you're a debt collector, then you fall under this law, which means you have to provide a validation notice, which limits when and how you can contact someone. So you just have to be careful about that. Don't claim to be an attorney or somebody who collects debts if you're not. All right, so let's uh, take a look at the practical exercise and apply some of the things we were just learning about. So practical exercise number two is over chapter 13, all of chapter 13. And you can submit it online before class on Thursday, not during or after class. Or just come to class and do it in class. You can read the rest of the announcement up there. So it tells me to click on this link. I click on this link. It says, take it now. Sure. And the directions also said, said if you may use your book and notes, you need your book and notes. So... Make sure if you do this online that you have your book and notes there to do it because it refers to pages and case problems in your book. And if you come to class to do this, make sure you bring your book to class. So the first question says, read case problem 13-4 on page 420 and then discuss a cause liability in these situations. So let's take a few minutes and... Read that and then we'll talk about it. All right, so in uh, case problem 13-4, she gets two new credit cards on the same date. And what's the difference? One she asked for, one she didn't. And then what happens? Yeah, well, there's a few other things that happen before they get stolen. Right, she uses one, she doesn't use one, and then uh, at some point someone steals both of them. And um, then there's a question about um, billing, right? Mm -hmm. So at the end she gets a bill, she wants to dispute it. So it just says discuss her liability in these situations. What page would you find some of those answers on? Yeah, I would say look at uh, 412 and 413. So bottom of page 412, credit card rules, top page 413, talks about um, what a cardholder's liability is. Um, on the top of page 413, it talks about consumers receiving unsolicited credit cards. And then in the next paragraph, it talks about billing disputes. So 412 and 413 is a good one to look for question one. All right, question two, read case problem 13.6 on page 421. Did the defendants violate the FCRA? And explain. So in 13.6, this is about the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, source 1 has a president who does some interesting things to get credit information and then sells it and claims not to know all the purposes it's sold for. And you're asked to explain whether the defendants violated the FCRA. Where is the FCRA in your chapter? 413, back to 413 again. So there on page 413 is probably what you need to know about the Fair Credit Reporting Act and when credit can be reported, for what purposes. Um, and then it does mention a case that this is based on, but you don't have to go find the case to answer this question. All right, next question. 
is up there on the screen, not in your book. Mike wants to go into business of direct merchandise sales. What are legal problems or issues that Mike might encounter in telemarketing, selling door to door, the internet, and soliciting sales through the mail? So we talked about each one of those areas. And um, some people have had a question about, well, what particular legal problems or issues are you talking about? Well, just basically generally talk about in each one of those areas, what kind of things should he be concerned with? For example, in door-to-door -door sales, what's one thing we mentioned that Mike ought to be concerned about? Three days. Right. This, this cooling off period. Right. So he's selling encyclopedias door-to-door, -door, which who wants a full set of encyclopedias these days? But if he sells it, is, um, is that a final sale or is there a statute that says that the consumer has a cooling off period? That's the kind of stuff I'm looking for, for that. Okay. Notice, if you didn't already, the first question is worth 10 points. So spend some time on that, fully discuss it, and don't be alarmed when there's only four questions. That's why. So the last question, question four, is actually on page 420, 13-1. Yeah, I just copied it. If you look at 13-1 in your book, it should be the same as what question 4 is up there. So under what contract theory can a seller be held liable to a consumer for physical harm or property damage is caused by the goods sold? And under what tort theories can a seller be held liable? So remember from the very start of this chapter, when I introduced the chapter, I said, which part of the chapter was like contracts? Seems like so long ago. Warranties. warranties, yes. So when you talk about contract theory, theories, look in the warranties part of the chapter. And then tort theory was like which part of the chapter? Strict liability, yes, is a tort theory. But what part of the chapter dealt with tort theory? All right, product liability. Right, so if a product is defective, what theories, what tort theories are there? And those are described in your chapter. That's all I'm looking for, for that question. Okay. So if you know where the contract theories and the tort theories are, you should do okay on Question four. Any questions about practical exercise? All right, I'll wrap it up, give you the rest of the time to work, leave, sing, run in place, whatever you want to do. Just want to dance? I hear you. And I'll see you next time or I won't. I should have this recording online later today if for some reason you want to go back and listen to the discussion of the practical exercise or something else profound that was said.